Hi everyone, my name's Errol Payne, CEO of As Good As Gold Australia. And today, once again, I'm joined by my brother Brian, partner of As Good As Gold. And firstly, what we'd like to do today is quickly remind everybody that we have uh, opened for business in Melbourne. Um, that took place two weeks ago, so mm. it was uh, Monday 14th of November. Yep. And mm. we opened up in Collins Street, 257 Collins Street, uh, we're at level three of the Emirates building, and it was a super grand opening, wasn't it, Brian? It we was helter skelter, but yep. we yeah got it all done. We had uh, something like uh, eighty people there, which were just to help us uh, engage. Uh, they were really the room was just full of positivity, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, Great right. vibes, yeah. and um, and of course everyone there was on the same page. Yeah. So it was uh, a great opening. So. Um, in the future, of course, if you want to connect with this Good Gold Australia, we have a one three hundred number one three hundred two nine five eight double three. As I said, we're in level three two fifty seven Collins Street, and we have plenty of stock. We are open for business and ready to go. That's Correct, right. Brian. Just, just want to explain that we're open for business in Melbourne as well as Adelaide. So uh, correct, yeah. <laughs> correct. Okay. Now, most importantly. Um, We'd like to uh, introduce our um, uh, the, the next gentleman who we, we're privileged, uh, and I say this, I've said this before, to, to be able to speak with a gentleman of this ilk. Um, Bill, of course, is, um, is an icon in the financial and precious metal space. Uh, so I'm talking, of course, of Bill Holter uh, from uh, his precious metals broker, of course, with Miles Franklin. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Bill. Good evening, guys. Firstly, Bill, uh, look, I've, I've got to highlight this, uh, and I guess whenever you hear a presentation discussion on precious metals, we always refer to um, the the lack of knowledge, I, I guess, that comes from the Fed and over here of the RBA, uh, not being able to determine uh, inflation, not having a really good understanding of it, and of course, this continues because we've now got the RBA over here, the RBA governor, governor um, forecasting more rate rises, higher energy bills, and for much longer than was initially thought. I mean, uh, give me a break. We all saw it coming, but, <laughs> but the professionals or the so-called professionals couldn't pick up on it. So what they're doing over here, Bill, is they're using um, in the, the excuse for inflation, climate change, and how it'll continue to put pressure on prices leading into <laughs> inflation. No reference, of course, to the absolute mismanagement of the economy and fiat currency for the last 50 years. That hasn't come into the equation. So they've at least acknowledged now that we have inflation, but they haven't acknowledged that we're going into a recession. And the charts, however, and this is really what I, I want to you, you know, just quickly or briefly talk about. The charts are providing a very different story. And I've, I've just documented these, these facts. The US Treasury curve is now more than 70% inverted. In the last 50 years of history, every time, every time we have surpassed this threshold, a recession has followed. We are now at 76% with the Fed still hiking rates and doing QT. I'd like your thoughts, Bill, because they get it wrong every time. It appears we're heading into, a, we, we are heading into a recession if we're not already in one. <clears throat> what I'd like is your thoughts on the oncoming recession. How quickly will the economy deteriorate from here? And what sort of duration are you expecting? Uh, well, first off, I believe History is going to show that the, the recession slash depression started pretty much uh, early this year or even late last year. I mean, we've had we had what three quarters of of negative GDP growth. Yep. They had a positive. The last quarter was a positive uh, GDP growth number, uh, but that can be massaged and fixed uh, to show what they want to show by just basically uh, moving the inflation numbers around. And I want to talk about inflation. Uh, the true definition of inflation or deflation 
is the increase or the decrease of money supply itself. If you can find a dictionary that's five years old or 10 years old before they started changing definitions, yeah, that's the true de definition of inflation. The, the central banks themselves are the ones that create inflation. Uh, for any central bank to say that climate change creates inflation is absolutely laughable. And bluntly, it's complete bullshit. I mean, climate change has nothing to do with inflation. Uh, I mean, you can look at uh, supply chains and things like that. And yes, that will affect prices of various items or specific items. But when you talk about inflation, it is basically, like you said, mismanagement. It's an over increase of money supply, which they've done for years and years and years. Yeah. Um, go back to the response to the 2007, 8, 9 uh, great financial crisis. Look at what all the central banks did. They flooded the system with, with liquidity, new currency, and the, the treasuries themselves exploded the amount of, of debt. I mean, they borrowed basically and, and spent from a fiscal standpoint like drunken sailors. Then let's fast forward to uh, 2020. Same thing. What was their response to, what was their response to, uh, to COVID? They flooded the markets again with liquidity. If you look at, the amount of debt outstanding, we got another spike after COVID started. So really, really and truly, inflation is man-made. It's not, uh, it has nothing to do with, with climate change. Uh, it has nothing to do with, I mean, you, you, it's so stupid today. You're hearing people uh, talk about equity. Or the word should be equality, but they use the word equity, and that causes inflation. Everything is misdirection, and I would suggest that people go back to the the uh, foundation, the nuts and bolts, whatever you want to call it, of the definition of inflation, the definition of deflation, uh, and and you and. Now to switch gears to what you were talking about, the in, inverted yield curve. I've talked about that. Uh, I've talked about that all year long because short term rates are higher than, than long term rates. And like you said, every single time, uh, over the last, uh, I guess 60 years in the United States. And of course that affects the rest of the world. Every single time we've had an inverted yield curve. We have had a recession follow. Now we have had recessions that were not caused by an inverted yield curve, but every time we've had an inverted yield curve, we have had a recession. And let me just add one more thing. What's coming, what we're headed into is not a recession. We are headed into a global depression uh, that will end in the bankruptcy, the default of, of many ends entities that you believed could never ever default and that's going to include some central banks and some sovereign treasuries so this is uh, this situation's been brought about by the fact I, i'm sure you'll agree and confirm that um, they've, they've just been kicking the can further down the road i mean it just reach if they'd have acknowledged the, the condition before and responsibilities attached um, we wouldn't be heading into this disaster of an economic collapse that we're confronted with right now. Would you agree? Right. They never, ever wanted to face the music. And when I yeah. say face the music, never wanted the populace, the public to understand how poorly uh, finance, uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy has been managed, literally uh, going into uh through the 1960s, then the U.S. went off the gold standard in 1971, and from that point forward, they spent they spent like drunken sailors, and they never wanted to admit that it was their policies that was the problem. So they kept kicking the can down the road, and here we are. Uh, this can I don't believe can be kicked. 
<laughs> so no short-term fix. How long could this economic collapse prevail? We're heading into a major depressionary period. As difficult well, as it might be to answer that. Yeah, let's look back to the Great Depression. The Great Depression started basically in 1929 and lasted all the way through to 1945. So that was 16 years. And what did it take to get the world out of a depression? It took a world war. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you, and just think back then, money was real. The world ran on, on real money. You didn't, yeah. and you did not have uh, any any institutions. You did not have the system as a whole. You did not have central banks. You did not have uh, sovereign treasuries that are as indebted as they are today. This is an absolute disaster. This is going to be a global a global bankruptcy. I mean, that's the best way to, or a global default. That's where this is headed. And I just want to, I don't have to remind you, but I'll remind your listeners, the reason you buy gold and the reason you buy silver is because gold and silver cannot default. And in a world where everything is defaulting around you, that's where you want to be. Some place where you cannot wake up tomorrow morning and find out you lost everything. I'm so glad we learned about this 30 years ago, Brian. And that expression of gold and silver cannot default is a, yeah, yeah that's, yep. <laughs> that's put it in a nutshell, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Look, thank, thanks, Bill. Um, not great news for uh, our viewing audience, <clears throat> but it's the... It is what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, look, I guess my next question, Bill, is about uh, silver in particular. And I've written down a couple of notes here, um, just so I wouldn't forget the numbers. But um, global demand for silver is expected to rise 16% this year to 1.21 billion ounces creating the biggest deficit in decades, according to the Silver Institute. Demand in India has almost doubled in 2022 as buyers took advantage of low prices to replenish stockpiles drawn down in 2020-21. Silver Institute predicted a deficit of 194 million ounces this year, up from 48 million ounces in 2021. It's quite dramatic. The amount of silver stored in vaults in London and New York monitored by the Comex Exchange and the London Bullion Market Association has fallen by around 370 million ounces, or 25% this year. Bill, the question I'd like to ask you is, how long can this continue before demand outstrips supply and forces silver prices into another stratosphere? Well, first off, I don't think that there is truly a billion ounces produced per year. So I think that deficit number is too small. Um, right. And you're using COMEX. Are you using COMEX or LBMA numbers? Uh, this is uh, COMEX. Okay. On COMEX, you're including both eligible and registered. Mm -hmm. If you look at, at what's happened just in the last couple of days, the amount standing for delivery, as I understand it, was 23 million ounces. And there's only uh, there's only 33 million ounces of eligible uh, for delivery that have have uh, uh, warrants attached to them. So you're using the whole amount, and that whole amount will never ever ever be delivered out because you've got. Uh, you have institutions, individuals, et cetera, that are basically storing on Comex, and the, that silver should never even be considered as deliverable. So right. we're, we're pretty close to that uh, uh, moment right now. Uh, unless they can come up with more silver, they're down to about 10 million ounces. And 10 million ounces in today's world is it's nothing. Think about this, guys. 10 million ounces... Uh, you're only looking at 250 million dollars. It's only a quarter of a billion. It's nothing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I slightly, agree. slightly underpriced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I think we're on the brink right now. Yeah. I mean, 
Uh, silver <coughs> was up um, in Aussie dollars. Silver was up seventy cents last night. A dollar fifty um, the night before. Um, so no, sorry, ninety cents. So we're up about a dollar fifty Aussie over the last couple of nights. Uh, I, I just think we're on the brink right now. Um, I, I think we're going to see something pretty exciting happen in the silver market um, um, as of pretty much immediately, and I'm glad I've got a lot of it. <laughs> well, guys, right. there's one yeah. other thing that's that's going on in the next within the next month. You've got uh, uh, President Xi from China is going to meet with Saudi Arabia sometime in the month of December. Yeah. If and I say if, I should say when Saudi Arabia begins accepting uh, currency other than dollars for payment, then it's all over for the dollar. And when it's all over for the dollar, it's completely all over for the Western financial system and all their central banks and all their treasuries. So this is, uh, and don't forget, uh, they've already, Saudi Arabia has already talked about joining the BRICS. Yes. And we also have something else interesting going on where Ghana is offering to pay uh, for oil in gold. And it's going to be interesting to see if that goes through. Yeah. So there's yeah. a bunch of things happening right now that look very well could uh, be displacing the U.S. dollar. Mm. Well, it takes about 100 years. We've always said that. 1918, end of World War One. Pretty much when uh, America uh, had access to more gold than anybody mm. else due to uh, their participation in World War One, goods and services to Great Britain. Uh, and where are we now? 2022. It's 100 uh, years. It's 103, four years. We're right on the button. Yeah, yeah at right the time button. of a changing of the baton, mm. yeah. pretty much as, as you've said, Bill. Yeah. Bill. Yep. Look, um, I'm glad we started with inflation because I want to uh, it's, you know, I want to continue on the inflation area because I don't think a lot of people understand, uh, especially the audience, don't understand how inflation really eats into your money supply, eats into your living standards, all sorts of things like that. And I continue to hear the Federal Reserve and governments around the world talking about uh, they want to try and keep to 2% inflation. Well, as Egon von Greyer says... 2% inflation, it takes 34 years to double. So in other words, you've got the double, co uh, your cost of goods will double every 34 years. Most people live into their 70s, so it's going to cost double for the first 34, another double again for the next 34. So I don't, well, I don't see, see an inflation position of 2% is a very good one. But I'm reading a book at the moment, Darren and I read, read a lot, and I'm sure you do too. It's called... When Money Dies. Great book. I'm about halfway through. Just going to read one line of that. But I want to give you an overall picture of what this book says <clears throat> and see if you think that I'm on, the, I'm on the right page. So presently I'm reading a book authored by Adam Ferguson, first published in 1975. The title of the book is When Money Dies. I'm just short of halfway, and the author writes about the money printing in Germany, Austria, and Hungary between the years of 1914 to 1923. This is about hyperinflation and what was the cause. Overall, it reminds me of inflation we have today, except today's inflation takes place over 110 years since the beginning of the Federal Reserve and involves nearly all countries in the world. Now, an example of inflation over this 110-year period is take, let's say, Henry Ford and the Ford Motor, uh, Ford Motor Company Model T Ford. It started off at $360 in 1908, right? Today's Mo Ford Falcon or in America, Ford Mondeo or whatever you like to say, is around about $40,000. Now, that's 10,500% increase in 110 years. Now, interesting enough, if you bought that Model T, uh, back in 1908, you pay for it in gold. Excuse me, you pay for it in gold, right? Because the $20 bill, right, the $20 US bill was what the price of gold was. So it was 18 ounces of gold. Now, interesting enough, we move forward 110 years, and you buy that same Ford car with all the bells and whistles on it, 
for 16 ounces of gold. It, rather interesting how gold maintains the money supply in a, in a real world. Now, let's go back. First gold world, is money. Yeah, because gold is gold is money, and you're comparing it with a currency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I want people to understand this. Guy, I'm going to ask a little bit about a gold standard right at the end. The First World War reparations of these countries of Germany, Russia, uh, sorry, Germany, Austria, and Hungary was unaffordable. So they printed the money, but the politicians denied time and time again that money printing was not the cause of inflation. From what I can see. The same problem exists today with the denial that money printing causes inflation. The only difference today is that all countries go into deficit spending, creating debt that can never be repaid and expect the next generation to fix the problem. So let me read out one line from this book and it's between, it's about the years of 1914 to 1918. So the author says, this is in Hungary. Between 1913 and the end of 1921, the currency in circulation increased by 64 times. An average number of domestic articles purchased in 1914 for 100 corona now costs for the same goods 8,260 corona. You can see how the printing of money, all it does is raises the prices of the goods. Now, let's look at 1960. So to now, today, 2022, we've had various wars. Today's wars cost mega billions. It equals debt, equals inflation. Bill, do you agree with my hypothesis that this is the real cause of inflation? I know we've talked about it, but I, I just, <laughs> yeah, and sure. I want to go on to a gold standard afterwards. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, the, the creation or the over-creation of currency of, I want to use the word currency instead of money, uh, but the overcreation of currency destroys the currency. So yeah, there's no question about it. But I do want to caution, we are going, and we're already seeing, we're living in a world where, where we're seeing inflation of the things we need and deflation of the things we have. Because don't forget, stocks, bonds, real estate, even cryptocurrencies, they got to the stupid uh, price levels that they got to with the use of credit, with the use of borrowed money. And part of the reason that governments, or one of the main reasons governments inflate is to make their own debt payable because they're paying it back with cheaper currency. Um, yeah. But understand that because we got to a debt satur saturation level, and there's there's not this this huge amount of of new money coming in like any Ponzi scheme needs new money constantly coming in. Since the tide is going out at this point, you're you're watching assets across the board deplate uh, deflate, whether it be stocks, uh, bonds deflating with interest rates going up, uh, real estate. Even cryptocurrencies with the, with the amount of leverage that was, was used there. Now that's defaulting and you're watching the price of, uh, even cryptocurrencies deflate. So on one hand, for the average person who does not invest, we're watching inflation of, uh, goods and services, the things we need to live. But on the other hand, we're watching deflation or lowering of prices, lowering of values of the things we have. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, quite true. Very, very true. I will say to this, on the beginning of the First World War, the major three countries involved was Britain, France and Germany. They all went off the gold standard within three to six months of that war started. So the rest of the year, the rest of the three and a half years, Daryl, was all fought with fiat currency. You know, and we can, you know, from Australia's point of view, we have Anz Anzac, uh, the battle at Anzac uh, Cove, and, and then we have the Western Front and things like this. It was just turmoil. And that's because they didn't have enough gold to pay for it. Yeah. It's very yep. simple. Yeah, very, very simple. Hmm. Just to finish off on this, 
I believe the only way out of this absolute mess is a gold standard. I've always believed that. And I know the gold standard to, be, to implement, not, not, not so easy, but if we can send people to Mars, we can, send, we can move back to a gold standard. I feel, I feel that we can do that. <laughs> but, Bill, what would, what would a gold standard be like for the world one year after implementation and 10 years after implementation? Uh, I believe 10 years after implementation, you would see a, a, a solid foundation. You'd see a solid financial uh, system. You'd see a solid, uh, you'd see real and fair uh, trade settlement. Things would be coming, would be becoming uh, fair, if you will. A year after a gold standard, I think there would be still all kinds of things upset because to go on to a gold standard means either you've already had a, just a rash of bankruptcies or a rash of bankruptcies are coming. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't think things would look really good within a year, but I do think within five to 10 years, you would see a system that, that reflects uh, truer values and real and fair trade settlement. Yeah, yeah, because we do have a lot of debt in the world, and that's got to be covered somehow. Yeah, you'd also see you would also see uh, countries. I guess you could say the West in general, but I'm just going to use the United States that tra that run such huge trade deficits. Those deficits could no longer be run. So countries like the U.S. would no longer be able to import all the goods they import, and then countries like China would not be able to export all the goods that they export. So it would it would put a damper initially on on trade because under a gold standard you're not able to run deficits unless you have the gold to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that, that um, countries like China, and I'm not beating, uh, uh, beating the chi Chinese way of uh, what life or its manufacturing, but the Chinese would, under a gold standard, would have to, their wages will be backed by gold. And if they don't have the gold, they don't have the wages, just like any other country in the world. So a gold standard is a level playing field for everybody. And, and the way to improve your country is to be able to produce things at a faster rate or a better rate or whatever, things like that. But everybody is paid the same. Well, let me add one more thing to that. Thanks, let me just add to that, that in, in today's world with today's pricing, at $1,800 US gold and what, $23 silver, there's not enough gold, there's not enough silver. To go around, they would have to be repriced many, many, many multiples higher in order to ration the supplies of gold globally and silver globally. So a gold standard, uh, I mean, just to pay off the U.S. debt with the amount of gold that the U.S. supposedly has, and they've not been audited since 1956, you're looking at a number well over one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars an ounce, and that's just to pay the on books debt. If you include all the uh, guarantees like Ginny Mae, Fannie Mae, uh, basically all the uh, Social Security, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, you're talking over two hundred billion dollars instead of thirty-one or two two hundred trillion dollars instead of thirty-one or thirty-two trillion. So instead of $125,000 an ounce, if it had to back everything, now you're looking at what? Uh, seven, dollars $800,000 an ounce. Yeah. And I know those numbers sound crazy, but that's what the numbers are. Mm. I'm glad you brought that up, Bill. Yes, because, yeah. yep, I'm glad you brought that up because that's the way it will be, is that the, if you hold gold and silver, those prices will be much higher than what they are today. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, it, my last question, Bill, is a, is a quick one. But I've got a couple of really interesting comments, and I just like your feedback on this. A lot of people think that the that bankers generally don't like gold. Mm. Um, it's a line of thought, and we don't hear 
banks very often talking about gold for us. Um, <laughs> they, they do own it themselves for uh, very genuine and obvious reasons, but they don't like us having the same advantage in holding it. But I thought these comments were really interesting and I, I'm really interested in your take on this as well, Bill. Um, last month, Peter Zollner, head of the banking department of the Bank for International Settlements, spoke at the Global Precious Metals Conference of the London Bullion Market Association held in Lisbon, Portugal. This is what Peter Zollner had to say about gold. Gold is durable and largely imperishable and nobody's liability if you hold it physically in your vaults, which frees it from default or counterparty risk. Unlike currencies and debt instruments, which are claims on foreign governments or institutions, gold kept in your vault isn't subject to political manipulation or monetary and fiscal policies. Gold has been proven to serve as an inflation hedge, although only over the long run. Most importantly, it is widely recognised for its potential value in highly adverse scenarios. This is the so-called war chest value or tail risk hedging value of gold, which is difficult to capture in standard quantitative analyses. Finally, Gold should not be seen as a dormant asset in a vault for the rainy days. Gold is an asset which offers opportunities in the financial markets. It can be used to create liquidity via gold currency swaps or as collateral, often more cheaply than using other assets. I mean, overall, Unusual. it's a pretty powerfully positive statement about gold. Does it surprise you coming from Peter Zollner or not? <laughs> what are your thoughts? Well, generally, I would say, yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised if the, if I heard him say that five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but I think they understand that gold is coming back into the system or yeah. and they will be part of it, obviously, because they sit on a bunch of gold. Um I think they understand that there's no holding it back. The gold is coming back into the system rather than being demonetized out of the system. And, and really, um, it was what he said was the, the true definition of money. It was long. Uh, yep. it was eloquent. And uh, I mean, I think I started off by saying the same thing. Gold and silver can't bankrupt or default. That's, Correct. that's the bottom line. Yeah. I think, yep. you know, he used a lot of. Eloquence, uh, a lot of words to say the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was I was struck by that, and uh, I thought like had had to put it forward because generally speaking, we don't expect that from bankers, and um, and the BIS of course is the central bank of central banks. So um, yeah, really positive, constructive stuff, mm. Bill. Thank you so much for your input again today. Look, uh, I, I must say this, that um, Charlie Tremendous Jones, uh, an American that Brian and I connected with many times over the years, used to speak about um, connecting with people who could help you um, move forward. Um, he said in five years, uh, 10 years time, that, um, you'll be in exactly the same position you're in right now, apart from two things, people you meet and the books you read. And I agree with him 100%. And there is an opportunity, of course, to connect with people like Bill Halter. And uh, um, um, I'm gonna suggest right now that our viewing audience should take advantage of that. If somebody wanted to, any of our viewing audience wanted to connect with you, Bill, learn more about gold, how, how would they make contact with you? They can either reach me through uh, www uh, milesfranklin.com mm -hmm. or you can go directly uh, if you want to contact me directly you can go through my email uh, it's bholter at hotmail.com fantastic I would Highly I wouldn't recommend. hesitate <laughs> I wouldn't hesitate um, I'd be making a connection immediately especially in this environment um, as uh, Peter Daniels would say our lifetime mentor 
I do not care what uh, what poorly executed economic decisions are made in the world tonight. Tomorrow I'll still be able to party because I own a lot of gold. And so does this whole family. They've created a dynasty. Um, it's been passed down, that knowledge of owning real money has been passed down through through his family, to, to his grandchildren today. So as he said, you've just got to have reserves and that's really what Bill's been exactly. confirming today. Yep. I'd like to thank also, uh, as well as Bill, uh, who is fantastic for as good as Gold Australia. Bill, we really appreciate your input. And we seriously appreciate the support from our viewing audience, from our subscribers. We'd like to thank them very much for continuing to do so and, uh, and say until next time, all stay well, um, stay well, stay focused and goodbye for now. <laughs> goodbye for now. Thanks, Bill.